Good evening, everyone. And we are here today on uh, a live program with uh, Dr. Temple Grandin and Dr. Stephen Shore, who do not really need an introduction. We all are very much aware about uh, the uh, eminent uh, impact that both these people have with their own uh, set of uh, personality, with their own set of uh, vision and advocacy work that they, they both of them do. And uh, they are the people who are really responsible, uh, the stakeholders for empowering the communities around children and families, especially working around autism. So uh, today I would also like all of you to uh, welcome and it is my pleasure to uh, have Samantha uh, from Sri Lanka. She is a parent of a young adult with autism and has worked for more than a decade in special education, advocacy, and parent support. And she also has re-educated herself in the area of special education after her son's autism diagnosis. She was the co-founder of a multidisciplinary center in Colombo, Sri Lanka for children with autism and developmental disabilities and has collaborated on organizing special events to promote disability awareness and inclusion and societal acceptance, such as workshops and awareness walks. And she's a firm believer of enabling parents and children. Her focus is to improve the outcomes of children with mainly autism and ADHD and to advocate for acceptance, inclusion and empowerment of children and adults with disabilities and to enable strategies to support parents of persons with disability. We welcome you, uh, Samantha. Uh, and uh, we are in fact, very happy to have you with us. I would uh, invite you to take up uh, 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 take up few words to uh, invite and and start the program with tech, te Dr. Temple and uh, Dr. Stephen for uh, people. Especially today, we are focusing on the communities around uh, around the country of Sri Lanka. Welcome, Samantha, and I would uh, want I would uh, request you to take over, please. Thank you, Manish. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, thank you so much. And good evening, everybody. And welcome to this evening of uh, live conversation and question and answers with Dr. Temple and Dr. Shaw. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for joining in and agreeing to share your experiences with uh, our Sri Lankan audience here today. And Manish, thank you so much for organizing this. If not for you, we won't have this program here. Um, everybody, Manish is, uh, I know Manish personally. He's been my son's occupational therapist for the last 12 years. And um, when Manish said, let's put this program together, something he's done both in Nepal and Bangladesh together with Dr. Sho and Dr. Temple, I, I um, welcomed it. Um, so Manish is an occupational therapist, uh, or, uh, PhD. He's also a certified um, sensory integration therapist and also a neurodevelopmental therapist. He runs a center for a multidisciplinary center in Gurgaon, India, and is on the advisory board of several schools and institutions. Uh, finally, Manish is also um, the president of the All India Association for Occupational Therapists, the Haryana chapter. Manish, thank you so much once again, and uh, over to you. So, uh... Uh, Dr. Temple, we would want you to start and uh, give us few few words that that would uh, focus on on your work, on your contribution, or a message from you. I must say uh, that you would like to give to people of Sri Lanka. Well, I'm Temple Brandon. I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, and I study um, animal behavior. And when I was a little kid. I had severe autism, uh, um, no speech until about age three to four. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance if you, of, of working with little kids. If you have a very small child, two, three, four years old, not talking, the worst thing you can do is to do nothing. You've got to start working with this child, interacting with them. I cannot emphasize that enough. And I was very lucky to get this. Another thing that helped me was um, my ability in art was always encouraged. And that became the basis of uh, designing and inventing things. Take the thing the child's good at 
build on it. You might have another child who's good at math or good at writing. Build on the area of strength. I cannot emphasize that enough because some of these kids are really smart. And the problem you've got with autism, it's a very big spectrum. It goes from maybe Einstein, who had no language till age th uh, three, to somebody who has difficulty dressing themselves. It's a very, very big spectrum. And I, it doesn't make very much sense that it's become such a big spectrum. Uh, what problem I'm seeing now with a lot of kids that get a label is uh, sometimes they'll do quite well academically, but they don't learn, learn enough life skills, things like shopping, learning how to work. And we'll be talking about some of those things later, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance I had of good teachers, an excellent speech teacher when I was two and a half, three years old, my mother always teaching me. Another thing that was helpful was in the US in the 50s in my generation, social skills were taught to all children. I had a wonderful science teacher and I was not a good student in high school. I was a bored student, poor student who did not care about studying. And then my science teacher got me interested in science. So now studying became a pathway to a goal. Really, really important. I had also a great primary school teacher, I had some excellent teachers. I really wanna you know, um, you know, compliment the, um, the teachers that I had. And I just wanna see um, some of these individuals get out there and, and be successful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Temple, uh, for such lovely words. Dr. Stephen, I would uh, make the same request from you. If you have anything that you would like to share about yourself, about your vision for these children, and also if you have any kind of a message that you would like to share with people of Sri Lanka. Dr. Stephen? Yeah, yeah, it was muted. Uh, yes, I certainly have a message. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephen Shore. I am a professor of special education at Adelphi University, uh, where I focus most of my teachings and research into developing fulfilling and productive lives for artistic individuals. Uh, I was, after 18 months of typical development, I was struck with the regressive autism bomb and like what happens to about 30% of us on the spectrum, at 18 months, I lost functional communication, had meltdowns, withdrew from the environment and became a very autistic little kid. Uh, it took a year for my parents to find a place for diagnosis. And when they did, the doctor said they had never seen such a sick child and they recommended institutionalization. Now, fortunately my parents uh, like with Temple's mother, and we're seeing increasing numbers of parents today, they advocated on my behalf. And they convinced the school to take me in about a year. And it was during that year that my parents implemented what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program. And it was a program that emphasized music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. And that's just today's terminology. Uh, in those days, the concept of early intervention didn't even exist. Uh, there weren't all the approaches that we have today. Uh, Jean Ayers was just beginning to get started with her ideas about sensory integration. But intuitively, my parents sensed that this is what I needed. And what did my parents do? Well, first, they tried to get me to imitate them. Now, imitation is a time-honored educational strategy. It works most of the time. But for us autistic people, perhaps due to differences in mirror neurons, we may not be able to imitate when young. So my parents flipped it around and they imitated me. And once they did that, I became aware of them in my environment. And I think the key implication is that as a prerequisite for doing solid work with an autistic person, you have to develop a bond, a trusting relationship. You've got to meet them where they are and then you can move on. And in doing so, my speech began to return at age four. And speaking of speech, 
which is communication. I think one of the most important things that we can do for autistic individuals is to provide a reliable means of communication. And for some of us, it may be talking just like we're talking right now. For others, it might mean using an assistive communication device of some kind. It might be using sign language. Uh, you that language and what well, mother did. You can see it in the, in, the, in the movie, the biography that was made of Temple Grandin, where her mother was working at teaching her the word cat. And that is, again, the most important thing we can do. I cannot overemphasize the importance of parents. Parents spend more time with their child than anybody else. And parents are a vital part of the team with various therapists, educators, and others to support the autistic person. Uh, like Temple said, it's important, to, it's important to look at the abilities. What, ask the question, what can the autistic person do? At age four, when speech had begun to return, my parents noticed me taking apart a watch with a sharp knife. I'd pop open the back, I'd extract the motor, I'd take out some of the gears, I'd spin them around, and then put it all back together again. The watch still worked, and there weren't any pieces left over. So incredible fine motor control to take apart a watch. But then my question always was, where did that fine motor control go when it came to penmanship? And as many of you know, so many of us autistic people are penmanship disaster areas. One of the worst experiences I could have in school would be to walk into a room with a paragraph on the board. Because what that meant is we were probably going to have to copy it down. And it would take me all period to get through a few words and everybody else had gone to recess. So back to my parents, noticing me taking apart watches they soon provided all kinds of other devices to take apart and put back together again. They supported my interests, they supported my strengths. And when we're able to support those interests and strengths, uh, then we have the real possibility of that autistic person leading a fulfilling and productive life, perhaps becoming a regional, national, or international expert on a particular subject. Now, one more point that I wanted to bring up is when we talk about the abilities that autism brings us, and they can be really significant, there are also challenges. The challenges are real. And a good example of that is my having the fine motor control to take apart a watch, not even using the right tools. But then where did that fine motor control go when it came to penmanship? And that's a question that, uh, you can ask your friendly occupational therapist about. But one thing that it does show us are the often sharp lines of demarcation between ability and disability that comes with autism. So my message to you is look for the interests, look for the strengths. These become levers in which to develop possible areas of study and employment later on. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stephen. And wonderful lines about a thin line between ability and disability. So uh, I would <clears throat> like to start a few questions that Samantha had really has, has done a lot of effort to kind of put them together from so many other people uh, for this program. So we don't have to really go through the chat. Uh, uh, not to say that we may not try to include them as well, but she has kind of accumulated all the questions in advance. So let me let me shoot them uh, directly. Uh, Dr. Temple, I think this question is, is, is very, very interesting and we would all like to know, how do you balance the seemingly contradictory goals of pushing the children forward to reach their potential versus understanding their difficulties and supporting their wants and desires? Well, I like to use the concept of stretching. You just go slightly outside their comfort zone. Also give choices. 
You could do this activity, maybe this sport or that sport, or you could do this type of art project or that type of art project. You give some choices, but if you don't stretch, they're not gonna develop. Now I wanna emphasize you don't shove them into a noisy market or noisy train station and they're gonna just go into sensory overload. That you don't do. On some of the problems with noise, if the child can control the noise, it'll be better tolerated. Let's just take something like a vacuum cleaner or hair dryer or something like that. And if the child can turn that on and off where they control it, then sometimes they might find they like the vacuum cleaner or the train station. Give them some control of how much time they spend at the train station. And if they raise their hand like this, you'll take them out of the train station. It's giving them some control. Now, I always talk about good teachers, all right? What is a good teacher? Sometimes it's a grandmother. It could just be somebody in the neighborhood and they have the ability to push just enough. So what is progress? In a little child, it'd be more speech. Also teaching turn-taking. When I was three and four years old, lots of turn-taking games because the child has to learn how to wait and take your turn at a game. Also, you're getting progress if you have more skills, using the uh, toilet, dressing, eating with utensils. So you're looking for skills, speech, turn-taking, interaction. Those would be things that would be progress. And I have found that some people have the ability to work with these kids and some don't. And sometimes it might be a grandmother in the neighborhood they'll have the ability to work with these young children. But if you have a young child that's not talking, do not wait two years for diagnosis. If they're not talking, you have to start working with them right now. Don't wait. <clears throat> the next question uh, is for Dr. Stephen, and especially because uh, I'm aware that he has a full course on this, this question. But still, let's 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 take it up, uh, Dr. Stephen. This is about how many types of therapies are there to cover all the areas, maybe right from the uh, right from being diagnosed as ASD. And the second sub part of that is how are different therapies selected and combined? All right, well, that, that's a great question, and there are so many well thought out therapies and strategies. So, for example, some of the some of the uh, well thought out and research strategies we have include applied behavior analysis, teach, daily life therapy, Miller method, floor time, relational development intervention, and certs. So which one do we choose? And that can be a challenge because these different modal uh, modalities or methods focus on different things. So the behavioral approaches, for example, focus on the study of behavior and use operant conditioning using a system of rewards and punishments, maybe not so much punishments these days, but rewards. And if we manipulate the environment, if we understand what uh, the child likes, which then become reinforcers, perhaps the child can be motivated by holding out a reinforcer such as uh, playing a, uh, uh, using a flight simulator on a computer. So if the child does what they need to do, such as they uh, perform to a certain level in mathematics, then they get 10 minutes on the flight simulator. Then there are the developmental approaches. The developmental approaches, such as the Miller method, such as uh, floor time, relational development intervention, focus on development. The, these practitioners ask, how does the autistic person perceive the environment? How does the autistic per person think? Cognition. How does the autistic person relate to others? So that's floor time and relational development intervention, RDI. And uh, taking the, uh, uh, the concept of reinforcement maybe a step further what we might see with say a Miller method practitioner or an RDI practitioner is 
they might find a way to use the flight simulator to teach mathematics and to become mathematics, inter to make mathematics interesting. And so which approach is the best one? And my answer is the approach that works, the approach that works. And another, another thing to consider is the importance of the therapist, teacher, as Temple said, maybe the grandmother in the unit to the child and to interact with the child in an intensive manner, to do it regularly. And I think this is what might have the greatest effect is the ability to interact with the child successfully and then secondarily, whether it's applied behavior analysis, Miller method, floor time, or some other approach. So uh, what we're getting to is an area of research that I have, which focuses on not trying to determine which approach is the best, but which approach is the best for a particular child at this time. And that's where we need to, that's where we need to take the conversation. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm sure that's a, that's a wonderful message again, uh, which approach is the best for the child is the, is the main question here. I have a specific question for uh, Dr. Temple. Uh, Dr. Temple, this is about uh, uh, this uh, parent probably is, is uh, keen on understanding a parenting more. And she has asked about uh, your mother's book called A Thorn in My Pocket. And the question that she uh, has said is that that uh, going through the book, she she's, she wants to know whether did the underlying stress add, add to the overload of her challenges and how did she work through any trauma at, at that point of uh, time? She also adds, uh, did she feel threatened by her father or responsible for the situation? Well, first of all, um, autism is, uh, uh, it's not caused by bad parenting. It's pretty much genetic. And uh, the same genes that make human beings have a very large brain. And there's a whole bunch of genes that make stem cells grow to build this big brain are the same genes that cause autism and schizophrenia. Uh, it has to do with brain development genes. See, a little bit of autism is just a personality variant. Uh, it's embedded in brain development. You're never going to get rid of it. I actually had my genome scanned and that's what we found out. Now I found out some other health problems like I've got really awful teeth and I'm really glad that I did not do uh, a tooth implants because my jaw could have fallen apart. That's something I found out from the, um, from the genome thing. But the autism genetics is embedded. Um, I have a book too that you might find really helpful. It's called The Way I See It. Now, both my mother's book and this book are available on Amazon as electronic books, also as audio books. It's the way I see it. It's a whole lot of little short chapters. And um, one of the things, my mother just had really good idea, really good instinct of just how much to push me. And she could see that I was progressing, that I was gradually progressing. I think another thing that helped is old fashioned 1950s upbringing in the US. In the 1950s, in my generation in the US, kids were taught to say, please and thank you, taught to shake hands, taught to sit at the table and use utensils. And if I did something really disgusting, like pick up rice with my hands and eat it, mother would tell me to use the utensil. Um, you know, she would tell me what I should do, chew with my mouth closed she would give the instruction. And she found that this worked and she could see that I was improving. And I was very lucky to get referred to a very good speech therapist at a very young age. In fact, the first doctor she took me to was a neurologist, not a psychologist, a neurologist. Checked me out for epilepsy and deafness. One thing you always have got to do with these little kids that are not talking, you do have to make sure they're not deaf. You've got to, you've, uh, because if you're deaf, you're not going to learn how to talk. Not knowing how to talk was very frustrating. I can remember having tantrums because I could not communicate. Um, but she could just see that what she was doing was working. I cannot emphasize enough 
The worst thing you can do with young children that are not talking is to do nothing. They need lots of hours of one-to-one -one intervention, turn-taking games, getting them connected to the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Temple. Uh, Dr. Stephen, this question again should go to you for sure because you have an entire book probably on, on the college and uh, older children. And this uh, question is about uh, teenage years to early adulthood are trying times for even neurotypical students. A lot of bullying and shaming takes place. Is it advisable to limit exposure to supervised social settings during this age? Or does the individual with autism still gain some skills? I think uh, social interaction is important because we are a social society. However, the key is how to socially interact. And we need to be taught to do so. Uh, we might need some direct instruction. Now that said, as Temples uh, mentioned earlier, autism is a spectrum. It's a wide spectrum. And like outside of the autism community with everybody else, some people are social butterflies and they're extreme extroverts and they thrive on social interaction. And then there are others who are a little bit more quiet and prefer to keep to themselves and you might say do minimal but enough social interaction. So we sh should see the same within the autism spectrum. Now, I think the key is uh, showing us how to interact and also interaction through our, our interests or favorite subjects. Small talk is really difficult for us. However, if you get us involved with something that we're interested in, such as my parents, I had a, uh, did for me, I had a hard time interacting in a typical manner. However, I had strong interests in bicycles and in music. So my parents got me involved in bicycle clubs and when I joined these clubs, we'd spend all day riding a bicycle, maybe doing a hundred miles. And I'd made a, I made a lot of friends, people of all ages. And uh, likewise with music, my parents got me involved in local ensembles. And now I was bringing my trombone and playing in various orchestras and bands and socially interacting that way. So what is important is that the interest is the mediator for social interaction. And this is what I found in middle school. Middle school is so challenging for people, autistic or otherwise. But for me, it was actually easier. And there's two big reasons. One is that somehow I realized that using words instead of sound effects from the environment really helped with social interaction. And then number two, I was able to engage and my focused interest of music. I joined the band. Now I had that structured activity in which to mediate my interactions with others. And that is why the arts are important. Physical education is important. Other courses such as wood shop, metal shop, working with your hands, those are important. I remember doing those classes. This was something that I was good at. And so often we find that we might have an autistic, and we can expand that to the general population. We might have a student who falls flat in academics and they don't do well at all. But when they get into one of these specials types of classes, be it wood shop, metal shop, uh, electronic shop, be it art, music, physical education, they can really shine. And this is an example of using a strength in which to promote success. And, and maybe this is the person who becomes an engineer. We need engineers. We still need people. What happened? Go ahead, uh, Dr. Stephen. I think somebody got unmuted uh, by- Oh, by okay, okay. Uh, this is why we need these special classes because we need people. We still need people to fix ventilation systems. We need people to fix our cars. We need people to build houses. And we're seeing these types of courses being cut back, which 
I think is a terrible thing. We need to keep them because people can be successful there as well. So in other words, uh, to sum it all up, what are the strengths? What are the interests? How can we use these strengths and interests to lever social interaction? Sure. Uh, do, uh, Dr. Temple, this is a question again, specifically to, to you. And the question is, question is something that is uh, close to my subject as well. The question is about sensitive issues. And the, and the question is, do you, just a bit, I'm trying to, yeah. Do you still have any sensory issues? And the second part is, if, if, if yes, how do you cope or overcome these sensory issues as of now? Uh, Dr. Temple, you are on mute. First, I would like to just um, say to everybody that I completely agree with what Stephen just said. Uh, I was bullied and teased in uh, when I was a teenager in school. And where I had friends was shared interests in things like electronics, for example, or horses. get their mic muted. Okay, talking about sensory issues, I have a very hard time dealing with, with too much background noise. If there's too much background noise, I simply cannot hear. I still have some auditory processing problems. But I wanna just say I agree with Stephen on keeping all the hands-on classes in the schools because when I was young in primary school, art was my favorite class. And I had friends through art. Um, I was in woodworking class and I was in a sewing class. These were my favorite classes. These are also things that can turn into careers. Okay, let's talk about sensory, but I did wanna make it very clear that everything that Stephen just previously said, I completely agree with. Um, I've worked with people on uh, mechanical equipment, um, very brilliant people that were probably autistic and they have good careers. Now, I had some problems with sound sensitivity loud noises, something like a hair dryer or a vacuum cleaner hurt my ears. Now, in the 50s, this is the bad thing, nobody knew about sensory uh, problems. It was not understood in the 50s. They just knew that large noisy places uh, bothered me. And my thing was popping balloons. I hated balloons because I never knew when they might pop. Now, what should have been done with that would be to make a balloon really small like this and then I take a pen and pop it where I'm controlling, I am controlling the popping. But I still have issues with some auditory processing. When I was very young and when the adults talked quickly, there was blah, 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 blah. That's all I could hear. And this is why it's so important when you're working uh, with the little kids uh, to slow down when you talk to them, slow down. My speech teacher would hold up a cup like this and she would say, say cup. And then she'd say, say cup, huh? Where she would slow down and enunciate the hard constant sounds. So slow down when you talk to the children. Another thing you've got to do is give them time to respond. If I was a computer, it's like having a very slow internet connection. You've got to give it time to download the website, which would be the talking. Give them time to respond. So I've got some auditory processing problems. Um, if I'm in a very noisy restaurant, I'm basically functionally deaf. I still am. Um, and and um, sensory issues are real. I also had problems with uh, scratchy clothing. Cannot stand scratchy clothing against my skin. Now, one of the issues today is wearing masks. Okay. Give the child some choices. You're gonna wear one, but you're gonna have some choices. And then practice wearing it at home because you things that are a surprise, a sudden surprise. We had a very bad situation where a, an autistic child went out to the airport and refused to wear a mask and was thrown off a flight. No, they should have been practicing wearing the mask two weeks before they went to the airport and give the child some choices of the masks. 
Sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Stephen, uh, this question, I, I would say probably you would be the best person working around or having so much of a literature around older people. This is about their sexual needs and this is about how can we, uh, uh, how can the adolescent children with autism, uh, how can we help them for their sexual needs? All right, well, it's, um, it's important to realize that everything we study of sexual orientation, preferences, and everything else related to sexual interaction that we see in the typical population is mirrored in the autistic population. So some autistic people have great desire for intimate relationships and of all kinds and others uh, have very little to no interest. So we have that wide range uh, that we see throughout humanity. So how to engage in uh, sexual relationships, intimate relationships, dating, and that's a challenge for everybody, autistic or otherwise. However, the big difference is that us autistic people, uh, we are deprived of a vital source of information uh, and exposure for dating, for developing intimate relationships with typical peers. We have less experience. And what that means is that we need direct instruction. We may need direct instruction. Now, the good news is that we can learn these things. The challenge is, is that a lot of people get very embarrassed and very squirrely talking about these things. That is the challenge. And with interaction, I think it's a myth that us autistic people do not want to socially interact. I think what happens is that, especially in grade school, we have so many bad experiences attempting to interact. And Temple has talked about some of hers. All of us can talk about our experiences and attempting to socially interact and getting bullied in return. So as a result, we just kind of give up and say this social interaction thing, it's just not worth it. It's gonna turn out badly. And I think that is what it keeps many people from attempting to socially interact. So getting back to uh, intimate relations and sexual uh, uh, interactions, we need to be taught body literacy. That's what I call it from an early age. So from an early age, we can learn what are the parts of the body? What are the formal names? And also what are the informal and slang names for these parts of the body? We also need to be taught uh, what is appropriate and inappropriate touch. So where is it appropriate to touch another person? And I think that's much better than talking about good touch, bad touch, or uh, what is private, and things like that. What is appropriate and what is inappropriate? Is it appropriate for a friend to touch you on the shoulder? Is it appropriate for someone to tell you to take off your underwear and show you private parts? Well, it depends on the situation. What if it's a doctor who's doing an examination? What if it's an older person who you thought was your friend? and now is asking you to do this. Is that correct? So we need to be taught these things directly uh, and provided explanations. Uh, when we get into sexual activity, it also means talking about masturbation. Masturbation, which just about everybody does, whether we want to admit it or not. So then the question is, where is it appropriate to engage in such behavior? And I think the best thing to do is to redirect this behavior, just like we could do with any behavior. There are times when it's appropriate, there are times when it's not. So re redirecting this behavior to the bedroom, your own bedroom. And this is where you can engage in masturbation, not in the bathroom, because that might be overgeneralized to your grandmother's bathroom. It might be overgeneralized to the train station bathroom. So not in the bathroom, just in your bedroom. And you can also teach the concept of closed doors. 
If a door is closed, you do not go in. If a door is closed and you want to go in, you knock first and wait for the person to say, come in. Or if they say, I'll be out later, you don't go in. And so we can teach the autistic person these strategies. And if this person is non-speaking, maybe you can set something up where the door, if the door is closed, they, they hang a towel. Band on the door, which means I not and getting to masturbation. Uh, most people figure out how to do this on their own, but for some autistic people, we may need to provide direct instruction so that it's done safely and it's done appropriately. And then the question is, who who should be authorized to provide this type of education? So these are just some of the things that I think of uh, in terms of relationships and sexuality. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stephen. I would uh, like to invite one of the parents uh, today present here on the Zoom meeting, uh, Ruwani Vikramratne, if, uh, uh, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Ruwani Vikramratne. All right, thank you so much, Manish. I'm really excited. Dr. Temple, you are actually my hero. I've learned more about autism from listening to you and you know reading your book and actually watching your movie as well, you know, about autism than anywhere else. So my question to you actually is, actually this is more like an emotional one. I would like to ask her, how would you feel? Like how would a child feel if we were to restrict them from harming themselves, like restrain them? to prevent them from harming themselves or harming anyone else. I would like to know the emotional aspect of it. Well, sometime, uh, uh, sometimes self-harm is, is sensory. Uh, there are some uh, children with, with, where the sensory input is scrambled. And uh, there's some really good books that you can read on, especially on individuals that remain nonverbal, where they describe a sensory scrambled world. One of the really good ones is written by um, a man from India. It's uh, called, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? It is available through the uh, electronic book at um, Amazon in the US. I do not know, you know, you can get it from Amazon, but you may have some other places you could get it from. But this will give you insight into a world of sensory scrambling. And sometimes, um, uh, they will self-harm themselves and may not realize they're doing it. And this is where an OT trained in sensory integration can be really helpful because you start doing things like deep pressure, a you know, weighted blanket or a weighted vest, or maybe swinging vestibular stimulation, uh, help the child to determine where his body boundary is and stop the, um, the, the self-harming. Yeah, and that's something you definitely want to do something about that. I also wanted to make a, a comment on uh, Ishanta Pereira's comment here about peer interactions. Um, I, you, it's shared interest. I can't emphasize enough the importance of shared interest. So if a school has a lot of activities, art, sports, theater, uh, electronics, uh, making robots, uh, chess club, uh, science fiction books, just lots of different things, then you find something that's a shared interest. Now, the other hand is a student has to be exposed to a lot of different things to develop a shared interest. Um, art, um, I was exposed to that. Um, if uh, One of the mistakes I think that's been made in education in some of our schools is you can study English and writing and reading, uh, mathematics and sports, and they've taken out things like learn, uh, fixing cars, art, theater, things like this, things that can become careers, things that um, a person with autism can be extremely good at, the skills that other people want. Um, and then getting into marriages where some people with autism have married. Usually where it's been the most successful is through shared interests. Maybe two computer programmers get together. And there are a lot of computer programmers 
a lot of big tech companies that are undiagnosed you know, mild autism. I've been to the tech companies. I've seen them. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty, very, very, very interesting. Uh, there's an, another very uh, uh, pertinent question, uh, Dr. Temple, from uh, with you, and that is about, and maybe Dr. Stephen can also join in. This is about how can I plan my autistic child's future for when I am no longer around? Uh, that's a really good question. Now, um, you see, this is where you have all different uh, degrees of autism. Uh, there are some individuals, no matter how much you work with them, they're going to have to live in a supervised living situation. And you need to start working on a slow transition to some of the alternative, you know, before you're really, you know, old. Recommend doing that. Then there's other individuals that need to be out working and being on their own. And I've seen problems where parents will be too overprotective and the child's not learning basic skills like shopping. And this individual is already a teenager. Work skills. They need to start learning how to do tasks outside the home on a schedule so they can get a job. Now I know in your country, you've got lots of little tiny shops and some of those are perfect places for you know kids starting around 11 or 12, start learning some work skills, selling stuff at, the, you know, at a little food stand. Uh, so that maybe they can become independent. I've seen big problems where you might have a very highly skilled person that should be getting a job in the computer industry and then they can't keep a job because they can't get to work on time. You know, uh, academics are important, but also when the child's a teenager, I want them learning how to work. Then they're not gonna have to depend on you when they grow up. And then there's others, especially if they remain nonverbal, even if they can learn to type, will need to be in some kind of a supported living situation. And so you have to you know, make those plans, but there's also a lot of individuals that could make it on their own because many times grandfathers are coming up to me, a lot of grandfathers, and they discover that they're autistic when the grandchildren get diagnosed. But that grandfather was an engineer or maybe he was an accountant. And one of the reasons why the grandfather was successful is, again, in my generation, much more structured social training. You know, Stephen talked about having to be instructed in different things. And, and uh, also they had jobs when they were young, delivering newspapers, things of this sort, learning those early social skills. And then today, the child's not learning enough skills. You know, there's a tendency to get too much into the label. Uh, we have to get back at looking at things, what they can do. I really like what Stephen Hawking had to say about disability. You know, you want to know who Stephen Hawking is, the famous physicist. And he said, concentrate on those things. Your disability does not prevent you from doing well. Concentrate on those things. Your disability does not prevent you from doing well. He could do math in his head really well, not much else, but the math in his head, he was figuring out all about how black holes in outer space work. Sure. Uh, Dr. Stephen, this question is about education and respite services. So a lot of parents, both of them working, both of them in, in, in a job, how can we, what, what can be done to ensure there is some kind of an empowerment, some kind of work happening with the child. If both the parents are working, given the fact that uh, the parent has written that in, in, in a country like Sri Lanka, and I'm sure it is true for India as well, there are no respite uh, care or services that can take care of these children, or probably that people may not be trained to take care of these children. But what do we do when if, if both the parents are in, in, in a job or a work life full time? All right. Well, this is a this is a, a big challenge uh, that we face, and we see it in the United States too, where both parents are working. So then, who's going to take care of the child? Uh, so a number of ideas come to mind. Uh, one is to uh, go back to Temple's recommendation: Is there somebody in the community 
such as a volunteer grandmother, somebody else, uh, who can, uh, who can, uh, who can be with the child and teach them work on communication and uh, social interaction. Another important thing to do is to uh, uh, look for your community, find other parents, others who have autistic children. And if you get involved in a community, autism society, and if there isn't one that exists, set one up. And now you have a community of parents, maybe 10, maybe 20, whatever, whatever that number is. And now that you're a group, you can do a lot more in supporting each other and supporting each other's children. So you don't have to go with this alone and you shouldn't go with this alone and find others who are experiencing the same situation. Sure. Uh, Dr. Stephen, in continuation to that question, how can we provide or how can we give uh, uh, education to children uh, in a context that has minimal resources? All right, uh, so with minimal resources, uh, there are some things that uh, hold true for autistic people and are easy to implement. Uh, one is to provide structure. Autistic people need structure and productivity uh, and predictability. And so for the uh, regular school teacher or for any teacher, a way to do that is to make sure you have a good schedule, have an agenda for the day. And this agenda could be represented using a word schedule and also using a picture schedule or a combined picture word schedule. So that way everybody knows that the first period is math, the second period is reading, then there's a break, then we have social studies, then we have physical education, then we have lunch or whatever the schedule might be. So having that predictability is helpful to everybody, it will help the autistic person and it will help everybody else. Also, as we think about teaching strategies, uh, throughout the world, most teaching occurs just like this. Uh, somebody is blabbing about something and talking a lot, and the students are expected to learn, memorize, and then reproduce it. But for us autistic people, uh, as Temple talked about earlier, when adults talked fast, all she heard was a, but, uh, a, a bunch of muddy mumbo jumbo, and she couldn't make sense. So Temple probably could have been helped by being provided a visual representation of the discussion, whatever it might be. Now we can take that to the classroom and teach using multiple modalities. So in addition to speaking, is there a way to show uh, what is being taught, to demonstrate, to use the kinesthetic sense, movement. The kinesthetic person is the person who learns by doing. Whereas the visual person is the person who learns by seeing. So being aware of these other senses and integrating them into the curriculum will make the curriculum more universal and be able to reach more people. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Stephen, for, for that. Uh, my next question, we, I think we just have a couple of minutes uh, before we conclude this program today. Dr. Temple, this question is, uh, is, is for you, and this is about your own personal experiences about how did you navigate the social world and relationships, your, your, own, your own experiences? Well, most of my friends and relationships are through shared interests. And I want to answer a question that was on the chat. How can you tell strengths in a four-year-old? That is too early. You're not going to be able to tell them. My strengths showed up more like at you know six years old, uh, uh, seven years old. That's when it started to show up. Um, I talked about the different kinds of minds. That some people are visual thinkers, think totally in pictures. That's me. There's others that think in more mathematics. And I discussed that in my book, The Autistic Brain. Um, 
And then there's kids that are word thinkers. Now I wanna mention here something that might be very helpful for nonverbal, making a schedule so they can live at home. Now, some of the nonverbals um, are not able to, um, uh, well, they, they work by touch. You might wanna try a touch schedule. They process very slowly. So five minutes before it's time to eat, you give them a spoon or some other utensil. Five minutes before it's time to bathe, they're handed a towel. Maybe five minutes before they're gonna go on the train, they're handed a toy train. In other words, they're given an object associated with the next thing and a few minutes to process it. Uh, you know, that's something might be helpful with older nonverbals, you know, for their um, schedule. But for me, relationships are pretty much through shared interests. You know, I want to talk about um, technical stuff, I, all kinds of technical stuff like these vaccines, for example, have to be kept very cold. How do you ship that? That to me is super interesting. It's called logistics. Those are the kinds of things I find super interesting. And as a visual thinker, we've made shipping mistakes with that vaccine already, bad ones. You see that to me, how to solve a problem like that is, is very interesting. And so I get with another person that likes to talk about technical things. That's where we have the best relationships. And I know that that's something that's hard to understand. And talking about dry ice in a box uh, that, that preserves the vaccine, that's super interesting to me. I know all about those boxes. I've looked at them up on the internet many times. And, and it makes the vaccine difficult to distribute. How do, you, how do you solve that problem? Um, now, I know that may not be what you want to hear, but um, to me, I find science super interesting. My favorite pleasure reading is science and nature. I can't wait to get my latest science and nature. And uh, we want to get out there and get these kids into a good career because it's much better to be fixing cars or fixing motorcycles. They're going to be much happier doing that than just um, sitting at home on watching uh, silly videos on the internet. It's a different way of thinking. Um, if somebody wants to translate my book, this book right here, the way I see it into these other languages, go right ahead and do it. I own the copyright on this book. Just go ahead and do it. Yeah, uh, and for those uh, languages. And you might just want to translate certain chapters, chapters in there on sensory, chapters on employment, or chapters on sensory problems, uh, you know, for your group. You have permission to translate uh, that book into the Tamil and the Singala language. Um, it's, a, it's, you see, a brain can be more interested in, in, uh, might say things, an intellectual or a brain can be more emotional. What turns me on is uh, solving problems. Like it really, really makes me happy. If somebody writes to me six months from now and something that I talked about in this meeting or I talked about in this book helped their child to get a job, help their child to learn speech, then that makes me real super happy. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's great, uh, Dr. Temple. And I would like to definitely connect with you over uh, translating this into, into some uh, um, native languages. And India is a country where there are many, many languages being, being spoken in different states. So it would be very interesting to have a, the chapter or the whole book, especially the chapter on sensory relevant for my own profession to be translated into different languages. I, I, I would I would like to you know do do that. So I, I have one last question, Dr. Temple, from you, especially because you have a book on it, and you would you would know uh, from the question probably uh, your book actually has that answer as well. My son is twelve and minimally verbal. He seems to be a visual thinker, and lately I'm beginning to feel that his vision is sometimes fragmented. He seems to notice tiny details rather than the whole. Is there anything you can share about this kind of 
fragmented vision? Well, there's there some people have described it. Um, you might want to read some of the work of Donna Williams. She has a book you can buy on Amazon electronically. It's called Autism, an Inside Out Approach. Autism, an Inside Out Approach by Donna Williams. Also Tito, and how can I talk if my lips don't move? He also describes fragmented vision. Now, the way the visual system works, your eyes work just like cameras, exactly like cameras. And then the signals that go to the back of the brain, but how does the brain store and, and, and retrieve memory files of pictures? Actually, science does not know, but they know from strokes or from head injuries to the back of the head that some of the systems that assemble the graphics file can get broken apart. So you get very strange things like if you're pouring coffee, you'll get stop motion coffee or cars going in stop motion like this or lose color vision. Tito describes looking at a door and he saw a blue blob. Then he saw the outline. You see the color circuit started working first and then the, the, the circuit for form, for shape started working. Donna Williams describes image breakup similar to a Picasso painting. This is where the brain is not working right inside here. The eye is fine. Nothing wrong with the eye. It's all back in here. One third of the brain is visual cortex. And how, I, I mean, if I took a flash drive and I put it in the time machine back to a hundred years ago, the best scientists in the world would not know how a movie or TV show or pictures were stored on that flash drive. We still don't know how the brain stores a graphics file, but we know that when things are wrong with the system, um, not everybody with autism has this problem. And individuals that have fragmented vision, they're gonna be auditory learners. They're more likely to be touch. These would be the individuals where the touch schedule, like giving them the spoon right before it's time to eat or the towel before it's time to bathe, or maybe some other, uh, you know, a ball before they go do an activity with that. Uh, but those sensory things are real. And one of the areas of research that I would put top priority on is the sensory issues. But the problem you have with them is that they're so variable. Only some people with autism have visual fragmentation. I don't have it. That's not a problem for me. Where somebody else has it. One person has sound sensitivity. Another person might have smell sensitivity. These sensory issues have to be studied by a diagnosis of a particular sensory issue, not a diagnosis of autism. Because then you're mixing apples, oranges, and all different kinds of stuff together. And then you get no results on the scientific study. But these are real. I would read that Donna Williams, an inside out approach, and then Tito. Uh, they both uh, describe sensory fragmentation, the visual fragmentation. And you can go to the eye doctor and they'll check the eyes. No problems in here. I think that's, that's about the time we had today. Uh, I must thank uh, you. Uh, no words are enough to thank you, Dr. Temple and Dr. Stephen. Uh, this is the third program that I, I am doing and you, both of you have been so, so supportive of uh, raising awareness, creating adv advocacy and empowering children and communities in not just India, but uh, around the neighboring countries where we might have challenges, uh, limited resources, but we are, we are here because we would like to do something about it. Uh, I want to make one other comment. Yes. You know, we've talked a lot about someone like me or someone like Stephen. You know, we're both professors. Now, obviously, there's a lot of individuals who are not going to become professors. But there's been some good cases where an individual, very severe, nonverbal, was in an institution and a doctor um, taught him how to make coffee and got him a job at a little store that sold coffee. And this gave him meaning in life. He was the coffee man. 
and he got a reputation for very good coffee. This is something that people appreciate. Okay, I hope that I'm... Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Dr. Temple. I hope that that um, I wasn't cut off. I've got to get yeah, you yeah. just went. No, geez. it wasn't cut off. And it wasn't cut off. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, when you're done, I'm going to add to that. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, the, and the, and that's true. Uh, there, uh, the people with autism and need more supports can lead fulfilling and productive lives. So for example, I know of a fellow in Florida who needs a lot of support with communication, a lot of support with social interaction and transportation. However, even though he doesn't interact much or communicate much, he loves to do nothing more than take laundry out of a hot dryer and fold it. And he folds it perfectly and he does it faster and better than anybody else. So that, he, he would love to help you fold your laundry too. But if you want him to do it, you have to pay him. That is his job. So he spends all day in a hot laundromat, pulling clothes out of a hot dryer, folding them perfectly, perfect creases, doing it quickly. He's enjoying it. He's getting meaning out of it. He's contributing to society. He's doing something that most people probably would be bored out of their minds doing, but he's getting meaning. And that's an example of somebody on the autism spectrum who needs more supports, but is still leading a fulfilling and productive life. I, may I request Samantha to uh, close the session with any, any words that she would like to add here? So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you Manish for organizing this. Thank you Dr. Temple, Dr. Shaw for sharing your valuable insights, your ideas and strategies. We're so grateful that you took the time to do this. Um, thank you so much everyone. Hoping to see you again the next time we organize a session like this. Soon Manish, I hope. Yes, of course. Yes, hopefully soon. Wonderful to be here, and I hope I gave you some practical ideas on uh, help um, you know these individuals uh, be you know contributors to society. You know, some can have high-level jobs like work for computer companies or be professors, but there's others doing something like the coffee or the laundry, where they get meaning doing a task that other people appreciate, and uh, meaningful work is is really important. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating actively and uh, listening to, to this program. Uh, and, and, and hope to see all of you once again with, with another program that, that might uh, do uh, some work about empowering children in communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Bye.